All right, so we're going to do a complete end-to-end -end from the very start, getting an idea, all the way through deploying it to production. Now, while we're going to be using a Java app for this, this is essentially exactly how we use team services to ship team services. It's almost the same workflow. So for this demo, I'm a Java dev. I work on the My Shuttle project on my team with Brian and a few others. And we have a simple little app that helps our shuttle drivers track their fares. And if we go look at it, log in, we can see you know, we've got a list of fares here. And you know, it, what it's missing is the total, the total sum of fares. So our job in this demo is going to be to add that feature to sum up our fares. So let's start. And we'll start by going to our Kanban board. This is where my team uses to manage all of their work to see what's going on. Right here, I've already got an item that's uh, waiting for me to pick, be picked up. Uh, it's already been broken out into tasks. It's been broken out with a couple test cases as well. But I'm just going to take this item, and I'm going to work on it. So let's move it into our expedite doing column. And then you know, at this point, we use Git. So the way that you actually work as a dev with Git is that you create a topic branch. You do your work there make sure it's good, put it through its gates, and then merge it up. So I could go over into my development tools and create the branch, but I really want to create a linkage between the work and the actual development that I do. And you know, project managers kind of hate having to go around and get people to update their bugs. So you know, wouldn't it be nice if I could just, you know, from this board, start out here and create a new branch? So that's what we're going to go do. And by doing this, we'll automatically link it up to, uh, to this work item. And we'll create our branch. This will take me to the Git repo with this new branch that we just created. So now I'm ready to actually implement the feature. Now I work as a Java dev in either Eclipse and IntelliJ or IntelliJ. In this case, we're going to use IntelliJ. So I could go over to IntelliJ. I could take the clone URL. I could use all the built-in Git stuff to clone it down, and all that would work fine. And we'll be using some of that. But we have a plugin for both Eclipse and IntelliJ that makes it really easy for developers to work with team services in those IDEs. And I'm going to show you a few features of those plugins as we go. And you know, the first feature is that regardless of which of the IDEs you're using, whether it's Android Studio or PyCharm uh, or WebStorm, or in this case, IntelliJ, just by doing that one simple click from the web, we're going to launch IntelliJ. It'll come up. We'll unlock our keychain. Hopefully, we'll unlock our keychain. And then it'll clone down that repository, check out the branch that we just created, open up the IntelliJ solution, and now I've got our project ready for me to work on right out of Team Services. A few other really cool features in this plugin. I can see the status of my build. So I can see down here that my master branch is green. So if anybody breaks my build while I'm in the IDE, which is where I spend a lot of time as a dev, I'll be able to see that. You can also see my issues. So if I go look at my work items here, I can see these are the work items that are assigned to me. And here's the first work item in our list that, we, uh, that we're working on right here. And I can see it's got a branch associated with it. So I can see that association if I'm working on multiple things at the same time. In fact, if I open up that work item, I can see in the development section over here, I have a link between the branch I created in my Git repo and that work item because I started from the backlog. OK, let's go ahead and make our code change. So we're implementing the summary. So the first thing we got to do is put our UI in place. And it turns out I am just one of those devs that just knows what the project team is when it wants. So I've already implemented it. So there's our UI. And uh, as luck would have it, I also need to implement it in our model. But uh, you know, that's already there, too. So great, we've implemented our feature. That was pretty easy. <laughs> I wish I could tell you we made everything that easy. OK, so now we're going to commit our changes locally to our Git repo. And it's got a summary of all the changes up there. But a lot of times, you know, I, I was smart in this flow in that I linked my work item before I even started. But sometimes you don't do that. Or sometimes it turns out you actually fix more items you know, in the process than what you plan to. So we make it really easy when you're actually committing to see the work that's assigned to you. So if you wanted to come in and say, you know, it turns out in doing this work, I actually took care of those issues too. So let me go ahead and link those up and have it populate my commit message to make that even easier. I can get that set up. So we'll just put in here our title, adding the summary, and commit that. 
So now we have our changes checked in locally. Now the way in Git that you typically flow your code is with pull requests. You create a pull request you know, to get your, these changes reviewed, make sure they're good, and then if, it, if it's uh, signed off on, then it flows up into the master branch. So again, in IntelliJ with our plugin, I can see all of the pull requests that are relevant to me. So in this case, I've got two pull requests from Sachin that he's asking me to review for him. Now, I'm doing a demo, so he's going to have to wait. Uh, I've got my changes I want to flow. So right in IntelliJ, I'm going to create a new pull request. And it's already got all the defaults filled out based on the commits that I put into it. I can review the summary of the actual code changes of the diff that I'm sending up, and then create the pull request. So this will do two things. It'll publish the local changes that we have in our local Git repo up to our, up to our branch in, t in team services, and it'll create the pull request. And if I follow this pull request, it'll show me the pull request in team services. Now, there's a couple of interesting things here to note. One, you know, we linked three work items in this process, one from the backlog, two from uh, inside of IntelliJ, and all three of them are associated with this particular pull request. You can also see down here that I have a reviewer, uh, in this case, Brian, because Brian is responsible for the code that I changed, so he automatically got added as a, re as a reviewer for this particular code. I can come in and I can also put a description, which is, you know, let's you know, hurry up because we need to get this done, and we have full markdown support, so I can put in emojis or whatever else I want to put as part of this. And I can see you know, down here that as I was doing this, uh, Brian already left a comment. And if I go into our file view, I can get the full view of the diff and the comment uh, that Brian's leaving. Oh, you know, uh, thanks, Brian. Like, I really appreciate that. So I'll just leave him another little handy emoji for that. So this is good. I'm feeling good about my change. And you know, I can see that Brian approved it, which is great. But if I look up here in the policy section, my problem is that I still have a policy failing. So we have a fully flexible policy system. So you can define whatever policies your team needs for how it works. And this is pretty similar to the ones that we use, which is I've configured it such that you have to have a reviewer sign off, and you have to have an automated build pass and say that this change is good before it goes up to master. So as soon as I created this pull request, it automatically triggered a build. And in this case, for some reason, the build's failing, so my policies aren't met. So I can jump right into that build. And if I go in here, I can see that we're using Maven to do the build. And if I look at the results, I can see we ran a bunch of tests. We have, a bunch of J, we have some JUnit tests. We also have code, Jococo code coverage down here that we're running as part of this. I can see my code coverage is a little bit low. I should we'll work on that in the future. But my problem is that you know, one of my tests failed. So if I drill into that, I can see you know, I've got, a, I've got uh, in this case, four tests. You know, Three of them are succeeding, one of them's failing. And I can see over here what's going on, where it's at. You know, this also could uh, start to be a trend. In fact, I can look and drill into a chart, and kind of not surprising for a demo, you can see it goes from like passing, failing, passing, failing pretty consistently, right? You can kind of guess why. But you know, if this, was, if this was something that I really wanted to keep track of because I'm having trouble with my PR build staying high quality, I want my team to stay on top of it, I can, just write, I can just click and add this to a dashboard. And now if I jump over and go to my team's dashboard, which is what my team has customized for all of the data that is relevant to us, you know, down here, we've pinned this particular widget. So if that's relevant to my team, then we can stay on top of that and drive more awareness in the team. We need to keep that up. All right, but I can see right here there's a unit test broken. That's my problem. Let's go get that fixed. So I'm going to go fix that unit test. But I could fix it and then submit it, wait for the build to run, then come back sometime later after I got coffee and see if it passed, and then click the Approve button, the Complete button for it to go. But I'm going to take advantage of another feature here, and the developers inside of Team Services use this a lot, which is because we have good automated policy in our DevOps system, I know if the build and test pass, this is going to be a good change, especially since Brian's also looked at the core change. I'm just going to mark it to autocomplete, which means as soon as this chain, as soon as all of the policies are met, it'll automatically merge in and let my code flow so I can keep it flowing as fast as possible. So I've got that set up. Now let's go back to IntelliJ and let's fix our test. And wouldn't you know it, I was also smart enough to have the unit test ready to go. 
Brian, if only you had more devs like me, right? Okay. And then we will commit and we'll send this up to the topic to our branch. It's already up there. This is another kind of cool way to use Git. And then if we go back, essentially what's happened is we kicked off a new build already. We've added another update. Another update's come in, update two. But we're going to do a little split, split screen magic here where we're going to pull out our build, set it off to the side here. And then what's going to happen if we get that over there? And then on the right, what you're going to see is the build's running. It's going to run Maven. It's going to run our JUnit tests. Assuming all of those pass, then the build's going to be marked as successful, which will mark the build policy on our pull requests as successful. When that's marked as successful, it will automatically complete the build and flow our change. So let's wait. The build succeeded. Policy succeeded. And there we go. Our pull request automatically completed, merging these changes up into the master branch because all of our policies were met. Now, if this was a bad change, I could revert this change pretty easily. If I needed to expedite this change out to production, I could cherry pick this up into a release branch. But in this case, uh, it automatically merged up. I have a nice, clean merge commit in my master branch. This merge commit has all the traceability we've been building up to this point. So this is the actual summary of the code changes that we made through those two commits. It's got a link to the pull request, so I can trace back to the history of the review. So if this is a bad change, I can blame Brian, because he signed off. Um, it's got a link to all three of those work items that have been part of this change that we've been going through. And it automatically triggered the main CI build for the master branch now that there's a new change in master. And that's already proceeding. And this particular build is doing a ton of stuff, right? In fact, let's go ahead and drill into this particular build and look at, see, and look at what it does. So what does it do? Primarily, it runs Maven. Runs Maven, produces a package file. Then it runs our, our unit tests with JUnit. Then it runs our code coverage with Jococo. Then it's going to do code analysis with SonarCube. Then, you know, Brian mentioned this was a Docker-based application. If I look at the Docker Compose file that powers it, it's actually a two-container application. It's got a web container and a database container. So the actual master, the build that's coming out of the master branch is going to build those two Docker, image, Docker images. It's doing that with our Docker task that we have and that we have updated versions available this week. Once you produce Docker containers, then what you do is you publish them to a registry. So you could publish this to any registry. You could publish it to the Docker Hub registry, whatever private one you've set up. You could also publish this to the new Azure Container Registry, which is what we're doing here. So again, with our built-in task, it's publishing it to uh, the, new, the Azure Container Registry. So it gets all of, those, all of those things going. The nice thing, though, is that those are what this one's doing. It can really do anything. In fact, if we go into our task catalog, you know, whether this was a .NET core, .NET core app or an Android app or an Xcode app or an Xamarin app, you could build it with it. Whether this is uh, for testing, if I wanted to use JMeter because this is a Java application, I could do that. For deployment, when we get to, when we get to that point, we could, we're going to use a bunch of Azure tasks. But I, if I wanted to use something like Chef, I could do that. If I wanted to use um, just run an SSH script, I could do that. There's a full set. And this is a growing ecosystem. Brian talked a little bit about that. We actually have two things that I think have really helped us drive this ecosystem the way, the way it has. One is that all of the tasks that we from Microsoft ship are open source on GitHub. So this has this is driven a nice, healthy community. And in fact, if we go look at um, our contributors, it's takes a little while to load because there's a pretty big set uh, here as we go through. Just lots and lots and lots. I have to move my mouse a couple of times of folks inside and outside the company that have been contributing to this. So that's been a big plus. The other thing is that via the marketplace, folks can, folks can install additional build and release extensions that add additional tasks and capabilities that you can use in your build or your release pipeline. And there's a lot and continuing to grow every single day. So let's go back and look at this build. It should have completed by now. 
If we jump in, it has. If you look at what this build actually did, you can see it ran our tests. All of them passed. That's great. It ran our code coverage. And I can actually see with this change, my code coverage is going down because I added more code than I, than I accounted for with my testing. So I should probably address that at some point. We also ran Sonar Cube. It says that my quality gate's passing. And I can drill in to the actual Sonar Cube dashboard from here. And this is telling me that you know, for this one, there were zero new bugs, zero new vulnerabilities. I had some outstanding debt previously, but I didn't incur any new ones as part of this particular build. So this change is OK to move forward. I can deal with that other debt um, whenever I get to it. The other thing on this down here at the bottom is the deployment section. So what's happened is I've kicked off a deployment automatically when we had a good build out of master. And in this case, we're automatically deploying to the development environment that we have set up because we want to get that going, make sure deployment's good, get our tests running on that. And if we drill into that particular release, in this case, it was release 50 that was automatically created, and we look at our logs, we can see that it's doing a couple of things. Of note, it's deploying to DCOS running in Azure Container Service. So it's taking those two Docker containers that are in the Azure Container Registry and deploying them into Azure in the Azure Container Service, and that'll be our running application. The other thing that it's doing once that app is now running is it's then using you know, Maven to go drive some Selenium tests to basically do functional tests to make sure the application itself that I currently deployed is, in fact, looking good. And that first deployment to our first development environment just, uh, just finished. And now if I go look at this release, I can see a bunch of things. I can see for this release to the development environment, all of my tests have passed and succeeded. So I know my app is looking good. I can also see effectively the release notes for this, for this release. Here are the three work items that we did in this process that are in this release as part of this change. Here are the commits, the core commit that we made to the master branch that is part of this release. If something's wrong with this deployment, it's going to be part of this code change, and I can trace it back and figure it out. And now, if we go to our, back to our app, and we look, we see we've, in fact, added our total. Not quite done yet, though, because if we go, this is our development environment. If we look at our actual production environments, and we go into that, you can see I don't actually have that feature yet. We haven't deployed it yet. And why is that? Well, if we jump back and we look at this release, I can see the development environment's at release 50. The production environment's still at release 49. It hasn't rolled out yet. And that's because the, develop, the production environment is set up with a manual gate to make sure someone has looked at it, reviewed it, and signed off that it's ready to roll out in production. And in this case, it's telling me that it's waiting for an approval. So I can come up here. And Brian and I are both the only people on the team that are allowed to actually approve a rollout to production. And I can approve it. And now it's going to run exactly that same automation that we used to deploy to developments that worked, and it'll deploy it to production. We wanted to have multiple environments you know, to go from development to test to staging to production. Like You can set that up however you want. Now, I know this is going to succeed because, it's, like I said, it's the same exact automation. So I'm ready to call this a success. Let's jump back to where we started. And I'm going to take this work item that we started, and I'm going to move it all the way over here into the Done column. And I'm going to come in. And I'm just going to say, and the other thing to note, you can see up here in the work item that uh, all of the things we've been building up have been linking to this work item because it's where we started. So full traceability. So I'll just come down here and I'll just say, at Brian, hey, check it out. And then I'll save it. And because I at mentioned Brian, he's now going to get an email notification telling him that someone's you know, calling him out in a work item. And it's all done. So Brian, check it out. What do you think? Awesome. Thank you.